Hey there, you're listening to the Swings and Studies podcast with your host, Jordan Perez. This podcast is designed to give you the latest in college golf in the form of interviews, analysis, the occasional hot take, and some good old commentary. If you want to keep up for more content, follow Swings and Studies on Twitter at Swings Studies. That's at Swings Studies. Enjoy the episode. I want to welcome a longtime Twitter mutual of mine who I've recently got the chance to chat with, Gabby Herzig. Gabby's a senior over at Pomona College and is the captain of the Pomona Pitzer State Hens. Side note, we're also recording this on Tiger Woods' birthday, so shout out and happy 45th to the GOAT. Um, Hope everybody's celebrating this national holiday in a safe way and the best way they know how to, (laughs) literally hitting the course. Uh, I discovered Gabby through her Twitter content where she posts killer swing videos, golf takes, and awesome digital content that she's been writing throughout her college career, including an incredible feature she recently wrote for golf.com about the reality of college golf in what she coined the Zoom era. So Gabby, how are you? How's your winter break been? And what have you been up to? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you so much for having me, Jordan. You're totally right. We've been following each other on Twitter for the longest time, so I'm glad we finally connected. (laughs) Um, I am currently on winter break from Pomona, so it's been nice not to be doing Zoom classes every day for a little while. Um, We have a really long winter break, so I'm not going back to school until January 25th, which I'm very excited about. So I have a nice time to relax, breathe, play some golf, and yeah, enjoy the holiday season. So I want to reach the intersection of both your golf and your media experience. So I kind of want to start with golf. Tell me about the first time you picked up a club and what led to that moment. Yeah, so I was introduced to golf actually by my grandparents. They are golf nuts. Um, My grandpa played golf at the University of Minnesota and my grandma was like a Minnesota junior state champion. Um, They absolutely loved the game, and I think they kind of just told my parents, like, your kids are playing golf. (laughs) There's no questions asked. So I remember, I think I was about five or six years old, um, and they took me to the range for the first time, and I was like really angry about going to the range. I really didn't want to (laughs) go. But I remember, I think, um, only, and the first time I hit a ball in the air, I think I was like set from that point on <laughs> and I was so happy. Um, and then ever since then, golf has been like an amazing way for me to um, kind of spend more time with my family. So I still play golf with my grandpa to this day. He's 88 and he can still walk 18 holes, no problem. Um, so it's been like absolutely amazing, the sport for me in terms of kind of getting to spend time with my family and you know meeting new people, making connections on and off the course. Um, and that's one of the reasons that I love golf and I've kept it up until this day. At what moment did you kind of realize that golf was something you were truly passionate about and you really wanted to stick with it as in like making it a part of your daily life? Yeah, I think, um, so the summer after my freshman year, um, I got the opportunity to work for Fox Sports and be kind of like a runner at the, um, U.S. Open at Shinnecock. So that was the 2018 U.S. Open. And I originally, I went into the experience kind of thinking I would be like, you know, getting people coffee and doing kind of normal runner tasks. But I ended up getting assigned to work with um, a features producer in the interview tent. And it, golf like really wasn't her expertise. Um, so I ended up like writing a lot of interview questions and doing a ton of research and kind of walking her through the PGA tour and pointing out players. And it was just the coolest experience to be kind of on the back end of everything that I am so used to watching on TV. Um, And at the same time, it being at such a huge important event. So that was really the moment where I realized, Oh, like I can actually make this into a career or pursue this like outside of college and outside of the competitive side of the sport. Um, And also I just kind of realized that like, I love golf so much and I can't imagine working and not like dealing with it every day or like being, having it be part of my daily routine and experience. So I definitely like had kind of a light bulb go off after that week with Fox Sports and I was like, oh, I can actually like pursue this and it could be so fun and amazing. When you talk about the moment that led there, thinking back to like your junior golf days and then getting into recruitment and deciding where to go for school. Um, 
what kind of led you to make such a big move? Because you're from New York and mm-hmm. you go to school in California. Yes. <laughs> what took you from the East Coast to the West Coast? Yeah, I, um, it was definitely like, I kind of made that decision late in my college process. So I went um, early decision two to Pomona. So I only really committed there like in the middle of my senior year. Um, and I just kind of realized that like, I wanted the experience of being able to play all year round. But at the same time, I went to kind of a, um, a rigorous, you know, high school in New York. And I really wanted the like kind of top tier academics that Pomona offered as well. So it was really the perfect combination. And I realized that I couldn't pass that up. So the combination of, of D3 golf, great academics, location, it was it was like a perfect match for me. So um, it was a big jump, definitely. But I felt like, you know, if, if, if there's any time to get out of New York, it's like my four years of college, I had that opportunity, why not do it? So I'm really glad that I did. And I, I love California, but I definitely think that heading back to the East Coast is in my future. So would you say you prefer the East Coast? I think so. I'm, I mean, I'm such, I'm so biased because I grew up in New York City. So it's, it's my favorite city in the world. I don't think anything compares to it. So I don't think I could live it. I don't, I think I could live in LA for a little bit, but not my whole life for sure. (laughs) So I want to talk more about your story for golf.com. It was a really great long form feature and you really delved into your own personal experience, but you also brought a lot of different voices to it as well. And it really helped substantiate an experience for a lot that a lot of people are going through. And I think is a little hard to see on the outside, especially this far into the pandemic, because I think a lot of people kind of assume that things are okay because it is a distance sport and they see power yeah. fives competing and they think, oh, everybody must be back to normal. Things are fine. But there is a, not so much an alternate re- reality, but comprehensively within college golf as a whole, there are still many teams and many programs who still can't compete and still not may not be able to for a while. How did that piece come together and was it any sort of difficult to write such a vulnerable piece? Yeah, it took me a while to write. I kind of wrote it over the span of a couple weeks, actually, um, just kind of piecing it together and getting in touch with other players. Um, And I actually thought of the idea, I was talking to Alan Chipnuck at the time, um, and he kind of gave me the idea of writing about like this weird golf experience that I'm having right now, because I told him, you know, I'm having Zoom meetings with my team, I'm on a practice schedule, but we're all scattered across the entire country. Then he thought that was really fascinating and suggests that I write about it and maybe get in touch with other players and see if their experiences were similar. And they were a little bit, which which was pretty surprising to me. Um, so it was a really fun piece to write. Obviously, it was very vulnerable. You know, it, it truly is like the the reality right now of you know staring at a screen all day and like golf being my only break from that um and I was completely honest in that description um and that like I literally would putt in my backyard purely just to get a break from work um because my eyes were just like fried from staring at a screen all day so it was it was a really fun honest piece to write and I'm really glad that it was able to be published on golf.com and kind of give the smaller college golf programs, the exposure that um, they're missing right now. Right. And that feature itself really does offer a lot of insight into the tough reality of being in a student athlete more Mm -hmm. so in a conference that doesn't permit athletic competition during this time. And you paint a good picture of your life at um, Pomona during the pandemic. But Mm -hmm. before we kind of dive into like the thick of the the semantics of what's going on right now. Can you walk me through a day in Gabby's life at Pomona as both a student and an athlete before this happened? Yeah, I can, I I can do that. I mean, it's, it's busy for sure. (laughs) Um, I would be in a normal semester. I'd take four classes. Um, So let's say um, it's like a Thursday in my daily schedule. So Um, We usually have a morning practice twice a week where we hit balls on the football field, actually. We hit like um, 50 to 
100, 115 yard shots and my coach just stands there and we hit balls at him as he moves to different distances. So that's a really fun practice, but we have to wake up at like 6.30. So um, that would probably be the first thing that I do. Um, and then after that, I eat breakfast um, at, eight, at like 8.39, then kind of rush to class afterwards. Then I'd probably have a little bit of a break in between classes where I'd, I don't know, catch up on reading, do last minute homework assignments, um, go to my next class. Then I maybe have a late lunch and then do homework for a couple hours. And then we usually have team workouts um, Tuesdays and Thursdays. So I, I probably have a workout from 6 to 7 p.m. Um, then after that, eat dinner and then back to work. <laughs> and during like kind of peak season on Thursdays and Fridays, I could actually be traveling. So I could be missing class completely um, in a van ride to Northern California or Arizona or wherever we're going that weekend. So it's definitely like an action packed schedule. And on top of that, if I'm like writing, I, I write for the school newspaper. So if I have an article due that week, I'm also trying to work on that. So it's definitely like a balance between all of the responsibilities going on um, but I love it and it, it kind of it makes my college experience more exciting so you talked about the difficulties of kind of staying connected with your team remotely but um, what's interesting is there is a unique challenge in building new relationships specifically with recruits can you kind of describe an instance where maybe it was tough to bridge you know something like feedback or maybe something during team bonding like has it been harder to like gel within the program being so far apart yeah for sure i mean we have been having kind of weekly zoom meetings since the beginning of the semester and um four of our new team members one is a transfer student and the other three are freshmen we've never met in person before so it's definitely like a weird and difficult dynamic to you know like get to know each other for the first time over zoom especially when you're supposed to be kind of like a close-knit team know everything about each other spend like 24 hours a day <laughs> with each other so it's definitely like a, a weird dynamic but i think we've been doing kind of the best job possible in terms of acclimating them to the team in this like digital zoom world um it's I, I i feel so badly for them at, that they don't have that same freshman experience that i did because i absolutely love my freshman year um i was thrown into this like crazy world of being a student athlete and it was hard but you know so pivotal to the rest of my college experience so we're just trying to you know do team bonding activities over Zoom, meet weekly, kind of just update each other on our lives and make the experience as normal as possible for them. But I, I'm so excited for them to be able to come back to campus, hopefully maybe this March or in the fall. Um, and hopefully, you know, the experiences they've had talking to us over Zoom, make them even more excited for that. So I'm, I'm excited for them, but also, you know, it's been tough and I understand um, the difficulties that they've been having. What specific things outside of like, the typical weekly exercises you guys do to still maintain uh, strength as a team. What kind of bonding activities have you guys implemented through Zoom? Yeah, it's mostly kind of just like each week, sometimes we'll come up with like a different topic for each Zoom. So a couple weeks ago, we, um, my coach came up with the idea that we do like, you know, a minute of like your golf story. So you kind of just tell um, everyone like how you started with the game like some competitive highlights you know your favorite favorite parts of golf um, just to kind of give everyone like a snapshot of you know how you got here and I think it was it was a really good exercise a really fun and kind of quick exercise to get to know everyone a little bit more um, we also recently had a zoom where we met the recruits for next year who just got into Pomona and Pitzer um, which was really cool. So it's it's awesome to get, you know see the team growing, even though we're at kind of a standstill right now. But we've been trying to you know just like connect as much as possible. We have our group chats on GroupMe and Snapchat. Um, but other than that, yeah, we've just been trying to keep in touch and and um, stay active on there. Do you think in some ways it might have brought the team closer? I think maybe a little bit. Um, 
it's definitely like a different dynamic because we're, you know, we're not eating meals together. We're not spending nearly as much time together. So it's always fun to get like little updates on everyone's life that makes it feel like we have those same, we're having those same experiences. But um, I think it could have brought the team closer together because, you know, we're really working hard to, to stick to a practice schedule, have these Zoom meetings, um, do conditioning. And I feel like some other teams at our level may not be doing the same thing. So in that case, I think that it, it could make us stronger in terms of, you know, we know that we're working hard in this weird time. And um, that might put us at an edge if we ever get, if we get to come back to competition later, later this spring, potentially. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been good so far. When you're in these weekly Zoom meetings and get togethers, et cetera, you guys are seemingly exchanging a constant flow of feedback based on the different practices and exercises you guys are doing individually. And mm -hmm. as a captain, do you find these methods of remote communication challenging, whether you're trying to convey something to another teammate or a co-captain or anybody? Yeah, I think one of the things that um, it has been interesting for me is like conveying my like current, you know, the things I'm working on in my swing and stuff to my coach even. Um, and I think maybe some of my teammates kind of are having that same thought and, you know, like it's, it's hard for someone who's not, you know, doing Zoom school to understand like the schedule and like the stress that we're under right now and how weird it is. So it's, it's sometimes difficult to, you know, say like, oh, I'm so busy right now. I, I can't go play golf this week or I can't, I can't do my workout today. Um, because it seems like, you know, we're not, we're doing nothing. We're just sitting around looking at our computers all day, but in reality, that's not the case. So I think it can be hard, um, in translation sometimes, you know, like understanding how, how draining this is and, um, and how hard it can be, even though, you know, it may seem like we're just sitting in our bed, like listening to classes all day. It's just, it's not that. And it's, it's, it causes a lot of stress and, um, it's like hard on you mentally when you, have to do everything that you did on a college campus in one bedroom or one room. Um, so I think that can be a little hard to, you know, communicate sometimes, especially with my coaches and, and professors even. Um, but it, I think people over the course of the semester started to understand a lot more, um, which has been great. And I think next semester will be better with that for sure. You talk about the little things that you did, like putting with the blast sensor and playing yeah. your 18 holes weekly being kind of your saving grace in a time where you feel so confined to just doing everything from a laptop. But was yeah. there ever a moment where finding that motivation was tough to just go through the motions? Yeah, for sure. I, I mean, I went like days or a week at a time without picking up a golf club because I purely was just so stressed. And I was like, is this worth it? We're not competing anytime soon. Um, like, why am I practicing so much? But, you know, at the end of the day, I kind of realized that it's, it's more than getting ready for competition. It's, it's more of like a, kind of like a mental break for me and just like mixing up your day is so important right now. And, um, you know, shutting that computer off, getting fresh air even, I think that was honestly one of the best parts of it for me. It was just being outside and not looking at my phone, um, not thinking about schoolwork. So golf is, is just such an amazing way to do that. Um, and I think a lot of people in quarantine have now realized that and started picking up the game, which is amazing to see. And I love that golf has grown so much since this, this whole thing started. Um, it's like the one good side effect here, but I, yeah, it, it was, it was tough sometimes to be like, to, you know, be like, I can write this essay later. Let me just go play nine holes. Um, sometimes that was hard, but I pushed myself to do it. And the fun part was I could, you know, take some friends out to play who aren't as familiar with the game um, because I'm living off campus with, with some friends, even though our whole campus is shut down. So I got some friends into it and got them hitting balls and then practicing. So that kind of motivated me to go to as like a little bit of a social activity. So that was definitely nice and new, um, different from, you know, the competitive aspect that I normally have at school, but it definitely encouraged me to go practice and, you know, take a break from that rigorous schedule. I'm going to quote one part of your piece, which you actually touched on each aspect of this individually. You said, the eight-hour van rides, 6 a.m. practice sessions, and weekly team dinners, which are all inherent parts of being on a college golf team, used to shape my everyday life as a Pomona student. 
these moments are snapshots unique to your college golf experience. Mm -hmm. What three snapshots would you say outside of like practices and the collaborative logistics of playing team golf through Zoom, so to speak, do you think kind of represent 2020 for you as a college golfer? That's a really, that's a really good question. I think definitely me like sitting in my backyard in my socks or like my pajamas putting for an hour, like that snapshot is for sure 2020. Um, I think maybe, you know, some of the new courses I've been able to explore um, in the Southern California area that I wouldn't normally have played um, in a team setting. So I have, I discovered this amazing course in Southern California called Oak Quarry um, and I play it all the time now. And so a snapshot of the beautiful view on like the 14th hole would definitely be another one. Um, and then I guess like there were a few times where I was, you know, carpooling to a golf course with friends and I was like doing work, reading or work on my computer in the back seat. Um, that, I mean, that's something I would do, you know, in one of those eight hour van rides is do homework. That's what we always do. But, you know, it was different, like going to play golf with new people, not my teammates. Um, and kind of experiencing that same time crunch to do work, even though we didn't really have a practice, like a full on campus practice schedule. Um, yeah, I think, I think those would be those three snapshots. And I think that's a, that's a really good exercise and it, it's for sure different than the on campus life. Um, and I think that those snapshots can really show you that. So when you talk about these team dinners, um, I, it's, lunchtime for me not gonna lie a little bit hungry what were they like um we would always you know kind of after our practice if, if it worked out with the with like eating schedules you know and the dining halls after our practices we would all just kind of go straight to Frary, which is like the main dining hall at Pomona and one of our favorite things to do was get um go to the omelet bar so we would all line up and we get our like custom omelets and we just kind of, you know, it's like, it's like a nice, I mean, for me and my friends at Pomona, one of our favorite things to do is have like link, long lengthy meals in the dining hall um, because the dining halls are like amazing at the Claremont colleges and like barely anyone eats off campus there. It's really good food, um, wow. which is, I know is so surprising for a college yeah. campus. <laughs> but we would basically um, like sit in the dining hall, you know, we'd all be in our in our golf gear so we stick out like a sore thumb in the dining hall <laughs> like wearing our little hats and skirts um so we would just kind of sit and like debrief and you know not talk about golf for a little bit which is nice um eat our omelets and then go on with our day so gearing back to kind of the present how would you describe your mindset kind of entering your senior spring? I know you've kind of got like a bit of an extended winter break, so that's probably not, not necessarily on the horizon, but it's still close enough. Mm -hmm. Do you kind of have an idea of what the remainder of your college golf career is going to look like? Yeah, I think it's going to be relatively similar to what we did in the fall, maybe like up to even more. I think our, our coach is planning on giving us kind of like a 20 hour a week practice schedule. So we'll probably play two rounds of 18 holes a week, two workouts, and then kind of range and putting practices when we, where we fit with our own schedule. Um, so it's probably going to be like that for the first couple of months. And then Pomona has said that there's a chance that students can come back to school um, in March after spring break. But I don't know if that's going to happen. I don't know if sports are going to be able to happen if that happens. So, you know, it's, it's really up in the air still. Um, obviously I would, I would love for the freshmen to have that opportunity to come back to campus. And I think they're going to be prioritized, which I think is, is um, really good. And I mean, probably the best decision that the school could make because I feel so bad that they're missing out on that freshman experience. Like I said earlier, it was so, it was so pivotal for me. Um, I'm living on like two minutes away from campus right now. Um, so it's been nice to, you know, have that like feeling of being at a campus, um, away from home. I live with three roommates and have been able to have some kind of social interaction through all of this, which is really nice. Um, so I think it's going to be a lot of the same of that and playing a lot more golf. Um, I'm only taking three classes next semester, so um, maybe I'll have a little more time on my hands. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's looking like I might not have any more competitive golf to play as a college student, which is really sad for me. And, you know, I haven't really played a competitive round for Pomona since the end of my sophomore year, basically, um, 
which is, it's sad to think about that I only really got two full seasons, but at the same time, I'm so grateful for those two seasons and, and all the experiences that I've had with my team, my teammates, and being captain was such an awesome leadership experience this, this year, and um, I'm, I'm proud of all that. So it's bittersweet, but at the same time, um, I feel like I'm going into, you know, graduation with a lot of amazing experiences under my belt. So I want to talk about more so, we, we did delve into this a little bit, but I want to tap into kind of the larger issue, which was, you know, giving some exposure to a side that people aren't necessarily familiar with in terms of the experiences at smaller programs. Most people kind of, I think, perceive that college golf is back because they know power fives are back in some yeah. semblance and they kind of think things are okay because it's distanced, which things really aren't super okay. <laughs> but outside of that, do you think there's more of so a general misunderstanding of kind of the issues and maybe like the culture surrounding playing at smaller schools and how those experiences at maybe like D1 power fives don't necessarily, they're not necessarily neck and neck with playing like at a smaller school. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's like a, it's a different world, honestly. Um, especially we're, we're obviously seeing the differences now and that they can compete and, you know, they have the funding to take those safety precautions. For example, like we were talking about what if we were brought back in the spring, you know, how would getting to and from competitions work? And we'd, you know, we can't sit in a van in the, that tiny van anymore because it's not social distance and um, we can't, you know, go to each other's rooms and, and all that kind of stuff. And um, I think at a D1 school, like the more resources you have, the more you're going to be able to do right now. Um, so, you know, they can fly private all over the country to compete. Um, like some of these schools have jets where they're just like flying across the country every weekend, which is insane for me to think about because, you know, we're literally like on these eight hour drives to different states. Um, so it's like, a, it's a totally different world. And then I guess aside from COVID, you know, on a daily basis, um, I think the, the academic side um, at a school like Pomona is a lot different from playing at some some of these D1 schools and that like for a lot of my teammates academics is our, a number one priority and golf comes second um, and I think playing in a D1 program it might be the other way around it, I mean it obviously depends on the individual but my coach will always say you know academics come first if you have like a test or a huge paper and you really need to excuse yourself from a practice or reschedule something to accommodate your academic schedule, like he will be very understanding of that. I don't think that's probably the same at a D1 school. So that's, it's, it's a completely different world, honestly. And, but I'm, I'm really glad at the end of the day that I chose um, to go D3 because I did have other priorities than golf and, you know, balancing that has been um, an amazing kind of like exercise in my daily life and learning how to be a student athlete and learning how to choose different things over others. Um, so yeah, I'm really glad that I chose that path at the end of the day. It's for sure different than the D1 lifestyle. <laughs> so one big positive for college golf, I'd say, was kind of an uptick in coverage. How positively do you think that sort of upward trend can bode for college golf, especially in a time where a mostly non-revenue sport is kind of struggling without being able to fully rely on big ticket sports. Yeah. I mean, I think it's amazing. I, I love watching other, you know, athletes my age compete at a high level because I've been there. I know how like high pressure that scenario is obviously not quite to the, you know, D1 NCAA championship level, but um, it's, it's amazing. And I think that it could inspire a lot of other young players to pick up the game and say, you know, hey, mom, that could be me on TV in five years. Um, I really want to get serious about this. And so I think it's amazing for the game. Um, I'm always happy to see golf growing in any capacity, especially on the college level. Um, and it's, it's also awesome to see, you know, players play in in the U.S. Open and the Masters and the Women's U.S. Open. There were some amateurs that were climbing up the leaderboard, which I love to see. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's, it's so cool. And I really hope that golf channel and the other networks continue to cover college golf and kind of recognize that it is so exciting and, you know, it's so high pressure and fun to watch. Um, 
and yeah, I think I think now with players like you know Matthew Wolf, Victor Hovland, some of these like young hot shots, it's becoming kind of more on people's radars because they're like, oh, there could be another Matthew Wolf coming in a year. I want to figure out who he is. I want to know about him before everyone else does. So I think that motivation could also be great for the game um, and great for college golf exposure. Another branch of that exposure was PGA Tour University, which kind of offers more of a linear path, so to speak, for collegiate men's golfers. How do you feel about programs like that? And do you think there needs to be more of a program for that on the women's side? Because obviously it's it's still like muddled and messy because there's so many different ways you can qualify and move through the ranks and there's no real linear path still for women's golfers. So how do you feel about that being introduced on the men's side and that giving players at that level some sort of path, but do you think there needs to be that on the women's side too? Yeah, I think absolutely that needs to happen on the women's side as well. I mean, it's definitely a common trend in in golf for something to be developed for the men's side before the women. So I'm not surprised by that. I haven't been following the program too closely, but I think it it would be really cool. I mean, I know the Q school route is incredibly expensive and often doesn't lead anywhere for a lot of people. Um, So finding an alternative to that, I mean, is amazing, but I think, you know, for it to truly be, um, like accepted and you know praised by the golf community I think I think it, ne- it needs to happen on the women's side for sure um, it's it's definitely upsetting to see kind of the like continued inequality in the in the golf world between you know men's and women's um, golf professionally and even co- like in college golf I know that some I think a couple of programs around the country maybe the men's teams are competing but the women's aren't which is great and mind-blowing to me um <laughs> And I'd, I'd love to like look into that further, but you know, I think that a pa- any pathway to the PJ tour for college students is great, but it being on both sides needs to happen immediately. <laughs> so talking about your resume, so to speak more so outside of being just an athlete, um, it's pretty stacked. You've had experiences at NBC sports. You're talking about being a runner at Fox sports, and now you have an upcoming internship at golf digest. What kind of takeaways throughout your college experiences in media have you made and how do you plan to bring those into your internship at Golf Digest? Yeah, I I have had like a very diverse kind of array of experiences in media. You know, I've been on like the production side, I've been on the digital editorial side at NBC. Um, now I'm getting more into like the direct writing side, which I love. Um, and I guess something I've learned over the past couple of years is is that finding those like unique like kind of niche stories is so gratifying and people really want to read them a lot of the time so last uh summer i think it was the summer of 2019 when i worked at nbc sports as an intern um i wrote a piece about akshay batia um who is now a professional and at the time he was the number one junior golfer in the world um and i i you know wrote this story kind of describing you know his confidence going into turning pro at 18 and and all these like kind of niche things about his practice schedule and um he gave me some crazy quotes about how he like his swing is better than tiger woods in some way um which was awesome to hear like the confidence of a 17 year old um but you know like finding those unique stories has been amazing for me and it's something that i want to continue to do especially at golf digest i think they do an amazing job of covering the golf world and you know making like creative um pieces out of you know a seemingly bland sport from the outside and I think they've done a really good job of kind of making it easier for others outside of the golf world to process and you know become interested in it so I think I really admire them on that front and I hope to kind of contribute to that Um, and then also just from like kind of a larger standpoint in terms of all the the opportunities I've been able to um, accept in like the media world I think like networking has been my number one savior and honestly just sending like cold emails to people Instagram DMs anything has been my like way that I've gotten to all these amazing places um, so I hope to kind of continue to do that and get to know my golf digest um, 
team members like really well, even, even though it's going to be over Zoom and remotely. So um, I definitely am carrying that with me and um, I'm very excited for the spring and for what's to come. Have you been able to kind of connect with some more of your team members at Golf Digest ahead of your internship? And uh, can you kind of lay out what your spring is going to look like with them? Yeah, I, so I first became super interested in Golf Digest after I worked at NBC. I reached out to Hallie Ledbetter um, from the social media team and she offered to take me into the office and show me around and I got to sit on sit in on a social media meeting which was amazing um, so cool to see kind of the behind the scenes of what I literally scroll through on my Instagram feed every single day um, golf digest is one of my favorite social accounts so it's it's kind of surreal to be actually working for them now um, and I really love the company and you know I kept that connection going throughout the following year. Um, and it, it was amazing because, you know, this internship opportunity popped up um, and I was able to kind of let them know that I'd been in the office before. And I, you know, I'm so inspired by the work they do. And I, I know Hallie personally. And um, so that connection like ended up helping me so much. And I've also been able to connect with um, Alan Pittman, who I'm going to be working with in my um, internship and some of the other writers but I don't really know exactly what the structure is going to be like yet. Um, I know that I'm going to be able to write and maybe work on a long, a long form piece throughout my um, couple months there. But other than that, I'm just kind of going with the flow. I will take on any tasks that they give me at this point and, you know, see where it takes me. Is there something about golf media that you wish would change or was different? And is there kind of anything that you hope to make an impact on in your career? Yeah, for sure. I mean, something I've definitely noticed, um, you know, joining the like golf Twitter world for the past couple of years, I, I, I really want to see, you know, more excitement around women's golf um, and less, you know, like putting the sport down in the comments. It's so, it's always so disappointing to see those kind of people saying, you know, it's so boring. I'm never going to watch that. And I, I think if, if I just would give it a chance, um, some of these young women's players, like Maria Fossey is one of my favorites, are so exciting to watch and incredibly impressive. So I hope that during my internship, I can cover women's golf a little bit, um, which is something I haven't really done, actually. I haven't really written a, um, a piece about women's golf before, um, which is, I think, just kind of the circumstance that I've been in. But I'm really excited about kind of exploring that more and maybe just like upping that excitement level and allowing people to give women's golf a chance and maybe in the long run that could help you know tv ratings go up um the sponsorships go up and everything could follow from there so i think it all really starts from social media honestly right now and sharing you know an article that i write could make the difference in someone deciding to turn on a lpga tournament one weekend which is honestly an awesome feeling so i hope something like that could happen during my internship and i'm definitely excited to do that yeah, social media is such a huge vehicle, especially nowadays for pushing so much golf content and kind of making waves through different stories. Like you said, you know, kind of covering those unknown topics or stories that you said have been gratifying for you uh, can really kind of change the scope or the way that someone thinks or someone might perceive, particularly in this topic, women's golf. And it's nice to know that there are so many individuals who are so passionate about bringing the women's golf game on an equal playing field as the men's golf game, because there's such a huge amount of talent that really gets undercovered and is not receiving the same amount of exposure. So it's really exciting to hear that you're passionate about that and you want to explore that in your internship. Yeah, for sure. I'm, it's, it's one of the things that I'm super excited about. And like, I will do anything to kind of get the, so the golf Twitter world, you know, like, m more rallied around women's golf. I mean, I think a lot of people are, but you know, some of the, some of those negative comments that you see, like, really, they really bog me down personally. Um, and I think probably it's the same with a lot of other women that see those on social media every day. So I mean, I'm hoping that some, a, a little thing that I write or, you know, something I post on social media could make the difference in, in someone's opinion. Right. It just takes those small changes, you know, mm -hmm. right, exactly. right, whether you're tweeting off one tweet or writing a story or et cetera, you know, it's 
putting that into people's minds and then they see your voice and they say, oh, Gabby said that. Oh, Gabby's bringing attention to this. That's Mm -hmm. awesome. And then they start paying attention. So it's a bit of a ripple effect, but you know, as time goes on, I think we will see the change. And I think we have in some spots, some spots, but it's still, there's still a lot of work to be done. For sure. So I want to aim off some sort of rapid fire questions, kind of in the spirit of New Year's, because it is December 30th and New Year's is on everybody's mind. I think everybody kind of wants to peace out of 2020. Um, But I just want to aim these few questions at you. So first off, do you have any New Year's resolutions? Are you a New Year's resolutions person at all? (laughs) Um, Typically, I haven't been, but I think that the the past couple of weeks actually I've been you know hitting the gym a lot more because I've had a lot of time on my hands um so I hope to continue that in 2020 I at the end of my sophomore year I like injured my back a little bit so I really want to like get the, my strength back in that area and not have to deal with a back injury ever again oh, wow. um and I'm definitely motivated to do that now that I have like a little more time on my hands and I've kind of learned how to do a routine that feels good for me. So I'm really hoping to continue that in 2021 and actually like stay, stick to it this time. How do you typically spend New Year's Eve and how do you plan to spend it this year? I mean, this year is going to be a little different. Normally I'm with um, all my cousins and we're, um, we all come to Arizona and kind of spend time with my grandparents every year. So this year we're obviously not going to be able to do that. It's probably just going to be me, my brother, um, and my parents kind of have having dinner, maybe having a little champagne, um, and just staying in, so indoors. I usually, I love playing golf on New Year's day. So hopefully I'll get a tea time. <laughs> um, and I get it, you know, I mean, the New Year's Eve day and get in, you know, that like last round of 2020. I love the the feeling of being like last putt of 2020. So hopefully I'll get that in. Where do you plan on playing? Um, I think we'll probably be playing at a, a local course in Arizona called Ganey Ranch. Um, it's one of my favorites. I've been playing it since I was young and just love it. Do you have a favorite personal memory of 2020? Oh, that's a good one. Um, what immediately came to mind golf wise is um, over the summer when I was in New York, I actually got to play Beth Page Black. Um, and that was surreal because I had watched the, um, the PGA championship there the year prior and, you know, seeing myself hitting some of the same shots that like Brooks Kepka hit and, you know, standing on those tee boxes that I saw like Phil Mickelson stand on. I mean, it was so awesome. And, it's a tough course and I struggled out there for sure, but it was an amazing experience. And I don't think I would have been able to do that without, you know, the pandemic going on and some of these tea times being open. So it was awesome. What was your favorite story to come out of golf in 2020? Oh, wow. That's a really good one too. Um, I've been so fascinated by Bryson's distance gaining. (laughs) And I think that a lot of people would probably say the same thing, but um, I, I've been, you know, watching, I don't know if you watch GM golf on YouTube or follow him on Instagram, but he has a recent YouTube video working out with Bryson DeChambeau and like going through his workout routine. And I highly suggest watching it because it's so fascinating what Bryson is doing to, you know, build up his strength and work these muscles that I've actually like never heard of before and some of these machines that he has in his garage are like the weirdest body contortions you can imagine um so it was super interesting to watch and I'm like very excited for what he does next and what numbers and records he breaks on the PGA Tour what was something you improved on related to golf and then what was something you improved on outside of it in 2020 um my I think I owe a lot of my good playing recently to that putting mat in my backyard because my putting has dramatically improved. Um, I feel so much more confident where putts now and, you know, making par saves and it can, it truly does change your game. Um, so I'm looking forward to, you know, continuing that and keeping my putting up. Um, and then something outside of that, um, I definitely like, I'm proud of where I am career wise and, you know, setting myself up for, um, an exciting future postgraduate. And um, I'm really excited for this Golf Digest opportunity. I'm 
I'm proud of myself for kind of achieving that goal. And it's some, it's a company that I've like looked up to for so long and I'm kind of still in shock that I actually get to work there. So that's something I'm super proud of. And, um, and I definitely improved at, you know, my networking skills and communication skills, especially over the pandemic and, you know, reaching out to whoever I could, even though it seemed uncomfortable or I was scared to at first, just kind of getting over that hump and doing it, it, it really pays off. And I'm proud of myself for kind of getting more comfortable with that. And finally, is there something, I think you've probably touched on it a little bit with your internship, but is there anything else you're looking forward to in 2021? Yeah, I mean, I'm looking forward to like maybe normalcy coming back. Um, I'm looking forward to maybe getting the vaccine later this year. Um, You know, just like getting back to those like normal routines that I was so um, grateful for in college and, and, you know, social events and um, being able to like hug people and all, all those little things that, you know, we're missing right now, fa- more face-to-face interaction. Um, I'm really looking forward to that. And hopefully, you know, our country can pick it up and get, get it together. Um, and if not, I mean, I, I think the world is kind of getting used to this whole Zoom world. Um, and a lot of amazing things have come because of it. And I probably wouldn't have been able to meet you without this. And, you know, all these like little connections that you wouldn't have probably made in in a normal year um, have been awesome. And it's kind of a great takeaway to something that didn't have many positives to it. Um, But yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to a return to some sort of normalcy in 2021, as I'm sure everyone is. Well, we're definitely making the turn. I mean, things seem to be brighter for the most part with approaching 2021.